OBS, but then I forgot to press the record button. Now it's recording. It's all good. All right. So up to this point, we talked about number representation. We talked about base conversion. That's where we started, right? We talked about so really those really odd bases, like who would use base seven? Okay, we talked about that. We talked about you know base two, which is you know what computers really are inside internally. And then we talked about what we what we can do with numbers. We can add numbers, okay? We can add base two numbers, we can add base seven numbers, we can subtract numbers, okay? We can subtract in base two, we can subtract in base seven, and so on. So we talked about representation, we talked about processing, which is basically just addition and subtraction. And trust me, that's all the computer knows how to do. It's just adding and subtracting. Subtracting implies comparison, because we talked about comparison in the previous class on last Thursday. And that's basically all the computer, all, all a, the core of a computer can do. Everything else can come as just you know, different steps, okay? You know, complicated loops and steps of performing those really basic operations. What about real numbers? What about the, the value of pi? Well, you cannot use an integer to represent it. I mean, if you do, it's going to be a really rough estimate, which is not, which is not good. So what we do have is our floating point numbers. And I think in CISP 360, you should be introduced to floating point numbers. They are basically the type of float and double. So how many people have some exposure to those two types, double and float? Okay, very good, excellent. <clears throat> so what we are doing today is to look into how numbers or values are represented using those representation. So as usual, I'm not going to talk about you know, the notes here because it's going to be boring. If I really have to talk about floating point number representation, this is the only thing I need to go. Okay, Just go to the Wikipedia page and we are done for this lecture. I'm not kidding you. I mean, this is the best way to summarize you know, the entire thing of what a floating point number is. I mean, you, it even has a nice picture of how a, a floating point number is broken up into the various parts. <clears throat> the next question is, but what is the value being represented by all these, all these different parts? Done right there. I don't have to do anything. So instead of doing it this way, I'm going to kind of ease into the representation kind of step by step, okay? So we'll start with how do we represent a value that is not an integer and only from the perspective of as a human, okay? All right, so let me switch to the tablet. Oh, not this one, there we go. Hopefully it's still connected. <clears throat> I still have some issues with uh, the Wi-Fi connection you know, between this and the, yep, it's not working. Okay, well, I have to debug that whole thing, but meanwhile, I'm not gonna spend extra time to do that, and instead, I will use just a regular text editor for this purpose. Give me a second here. Um, mouse pad is, should be open already. There we go, okay. So let me just clean this up, okay? Get rid of all of this stuff here. So the first question is, how do we represent, um, let me give it a, some thoughts here, um, 23.125, okay? This is a base 10 number, so I'm gonna emphasize that this is a base 10 number. And the first thing I wanna do is to look at this value and say, well, can I use a binary number to represent this particular value, which we see as a base 10 number. In other words, I'm asking you to do base conversion. Do you still remember base conversion? Okay, and I just want to convert it into base two. So can someone tell me how to get started with that process? Okay. Very good, so let's start with some powers of two. So we'll start with 32, 16, eight, four, two, one. Is that a power of two? Yep, that's also a power of two, and so is that, okay? So we have a bunch of powers of two. 
So once we have these powers of two, phase two conversion is really easy. It doesn't involve division. It only involves comparison, okay? In other words, we're comparing 23.125 to 32. Nope, you know, we don't have a, a 32 in here. Ah, with a 16, yep, we got one of those. And with one of the 16, how much is left? 7.125 is remaining, right? So we look at the eight here and go like, nah, eight is too much, okay? We just need 7.125. But we'll take one of the fours so that we have 3.125 left. And then we'll take a two so that we have 1.125 left. And then we'll take a one so that we have 0 0.125 left. And we're not gonna take any half. We're not to take any quarters. Uh, but we will take an eighth, okay? So we, after we take the eighth, then we have none left. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what I'm writing here? You know, what the ones are representing? We'll just take one of those powers of two, and the rightmost column is representing what is left after we take one of the powers of two. What is the remaining portion? So are we good so far? All right. So just to make this you know, more complete, you know, we, just to be more consistent, that means you know, the original one starts with the 23.125 over here because that's the initial amount. Okay, so when you look at this, you go like, well, but I don't see a binary number here. Okay, so let's turn this into a binary number. So to turn this into a binary number, I just have to be a little bit more explicit and say that we have none of those things, right? So none of that and none of that. So now we have to go like, but this is a one, okay? This is one times two to the power of zero. This is one times two to the power of negative one. So that means, you know, we need some kind of a divider here so that we can divide the non-negative powers of two, which means, you know, the bar and everything up, and the negative powers of two, which are everything that is below that bar. Is that okay? So this is a bar in this representation, but in normal number representation, we use a point for that, okay? That's what the quote-unquote decimal point is for. It is a separator. It is a separator to separate the quantity of whatever base to the power of zero from the same base to the power of negative one. That's what the point is. So that means you know, if I want to write this number as a base two number, I would basically write it as zero, whoops, um, move my, where's my cursor? There we go. 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, point zero, zero, 1 in base 2. That is the binary number. So once again, the purpose of the point here is only to act as a separator, okay? It tells us where is the quantity of 2 to the power of 0 and where is the quantity of 2 to the power of negative 1. Because without that point, it's like, um, so where is you know, two to the power of zero? What is the, where's the quantity of two to the power of zero? That's the only purpose of that point. <clears throat> Do we have any questions at this point? No pun intended. Yes? We'll get to that, okay? But this is the first step. This is the first step to understand what is a double or a floating point representation, okay? All right, this is kind of cool. So if I say, okay, so now we, we, we want to talk about some definitions. And before we talk about that definition, we will, we'll go back to base 10 for now, okay? So if you're in base 10, and I want you to tell me what is the speed of light in meters per second, okay? What is that number? Hmm? Three times 10 to the power of eight. Okay, can, can you give me an integer? Can you represent that as an integer? What, what does it look like as an integer? So it'd be three, zero, zero, followed by how many more zeros? One, two, three, four, five, six. Very good, okay. So every time, if I want to refer to the speed of light, I have to say three followed by eight zeros meters per second. That doesn't seem very handy, okay? So instead of doing this, I can now say, mm, 
That doesn't look handy. So in C++ and most other languages, you can express the same amount as 3E8, okay? This is what we call the floating point notation, or this is called the um, scientific notation. The best way to describe it is it's called the scientific notation. So three is a multiply, it's a coefficient, okay? But three is multiplied by 10 to the power of eight. So whatever is to the right-hand side of the lowercase e, I believe uppercase e works too, but whatever is to the right-hand side of the e specifies the power of 10 as a magnitude in order to multiply the coefficient, which is on the left-hand side of the e. Is that notation okay? Okay. All right, so if I were to give you a more abstract case, okay, so whatever x is is you know, a number to the left-hand side of the e, and then y is whatever is to the right-hand side of the e, then the value being represented, okay, this is basically x times, because we're dealing with base 10, so it would be 10 to the power of y. Are we still doing okay so far with this notation? That caret symbol is not exclusive or, it is to the power of. If you do not like that symbol, I can you know, change it a little bit here and use the power function because it's 10 to the power of y. This, is, this may be a slightly better way to describe it. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay, this is a handy way for us to you know, specify with low precision but a huge amount of number, okay? Uh, for those of you who took, who have taken chemistry classes, what is a mole? M O L E. Okay, six point three three times ten to the power of twenty three. Okay, so this is the scientific notation of saying six point three three times ten to the power of twenty three. Without the scientific notation, you're going to have to write. 6, 3, 3, and then followed by 20 zeros every single time when you refer to the quantity of mole, which is not fun, okay? Is that okay? Does everybody understand what is the scientific notation? You have a coefficient, which I call x in the template, and then you have an exponent of 10 in this case because these are base 10 scientific notation. Are we good? Okay, all right. So now we define yet another term. Okay, so when we, then we say when x is greater than or equal to zero, oops, one, sorry, and x is less than whatever the base we're using, in this case is 10, then x as a coefficient is also known as the mantissa. It's just a name. So when the coefficient meets these requirements, being at least one, but less than the base, in base 10, it means it can, it can be up to 9.99999, okay? Then x is also known as a mantissa. So a mantissa is a special case of a coefficient. But it has a special meaning that is useful in this class. So that's why I have to mention it. So are we doing okay so far? Yes, no, maybe. Yes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. We only approximate. <laughs> there are many, many values that we cannot represent. Okay, so we can only represent the closest value to whatever you actually want to represent. So irrational numbers, you're basically referring to irrational numbers or even rational numbers. We cannot represent something as simple as 22 divided by seven, which is a good approximation of pi. But even that, you cannot represent exactly using the built-in types of C because, well, it's gonna have a recurring part of the decimal points, right? One divided by three is 0.3333 and the three just goes on forever. So there are many values we cannot represent exactly, but we can get pretty close, okay? And we'll talk about how close we can get later on in this, in maybe not today, but maybe in the next class or so. All right, but that's a good question. Do we have any questions up to this point? Do we have any questions about the, the scientific notation? It is. It has one coefficient, 
and an exponent of whatever base we choose to use. Yes? So in your image, the formula, mm -hmm. uh, the nope, it is 10. Okay. E is just a notation to separate the mantissa or the coefficient from the exponent. So the 23 in this case is called the exponent, but it's the exponent of 10 because this is a base 10 scientific notation. All right. Any other questions? Okay. So seemingly unrelated, I'm going to do something over here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is to say, hmm. I want to represent this number as 1011.1001 in base 2. And I have to, I can adjust it, okay? So I'm using an equality here. <clears throat> and I need to find out what power of 2 do I need to multiply in order for the two sides of the equality to be the same. So I put a question mark here. That's the only thing I need to figure out. So how would you, you know, answer this question? Okay, let me repeat the question. On one side, I have 10111.001 as a base two. Look, that's a number. On the other side, we have a product, okay, because you know that's multiplication. The left hand side of the product is 1011.1001 in base two. The right hand side of the product is some power of two. The question is, what should I use as the question mark? Yep. So is it one or is it negative one? How can you figure that out? There are many ways to figure this out, okay? You guys already know how to figure it out. You have the knowledge already. You just have to make the connections, okay? So let me, let me explain what I mean by that, okay? So what you need to do is to look at 10111.001 and break it back down into quantities of powers of 2, okay? So this one is what, 32 plus um, 8, oh, nope, I got it wrong. So it's 16 plus a 4 plus 2 plus 1 plus a point one two five, right? That's exactly how we got the number to begin with. So the other side has what? It has an 8 plus a 2 plus a 1 plus a half plus a point, um, uh, point zero six two five, I think, because that's 1 half of point one two five. Nope, I, I'm missing one here. Okay, there we go. And I want to take the sum of this which is you know, basically what the base two number is, times your know, sum power of two. That is what I'm trying to solve, right? So you look at this and go like, okay, I can, I can solve this. this. I have taken algebra, um, I can do this. Now, by the way, this is algebra, I think two, okay? In other words, if you have graduated from high school, you should be able to solve this, okay? And I'm not kidding, okay? This is my expectation. You should be able to solve this. Yes? It's a one, exactly. How do you know, wh what pattern are you noticing? It's one half of what it used to be, right? You can see how the eight is one half of the 16, the two is one half of the four, the one is, the, is one half of the two, the 0.5 is one half of the one, and then lastly, we have the 0 0.61, 2, 6, 0 0.6125 is one half of the 0.125. In other words, oh, so everything, all the powers of two are now one half of what they used to be. So that means to compensate for having everything, I have to multiply the entire thing by two. Two is also known as two to the power of one. Okay. So now we can solve the question mark. It is just, eh, we can put a one here. Is that math doing okay? So this goes back to how we represent values in whatever base we choose to use. 
Okay, so I just want to make that connection because you're know, making those connections is really important because otherwise your brain will be filled up with lots of lots of your know, pine needles, but not a way to organize the pine needles. All right, so if that is the case, okay, um, I'm going to push this one more time. It's like 101.11001 uh, 1, 1, in base 2. And what power of 2 do we need now? It'll be 2. Okay. I think you guys can see where I'm going. Okay. So uh, if I want to push the point one more time to the left-hand side, now I have 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1 in base 2 times the power 2 to the power 3, okay, and let's do it one more time, okay, 1.0111001 1, 1, 0, 0, 1 in base 2 times 2 to the power of 4, okay, so does that remind you of what we saw here? We have a coefficient times whatever base, because we're using base 2, to the power of something. Do you see that? Do you see the pattern? Okay, I see, I see a few nods, but I want to make sure the entire class is making that connection between the base 10 scientific notation, which is here, and the very specific example of a base 2, quote unquote, scientific notation. Are we still doing okay? I will give you guys some time to think about it, and if you are not making the connection, you need to let me know. Are we good? Okay, all right. So this part here is a base two, quote unquote, scientific notation. So the next question, remember I talked about the mantissa? <clears throat> this number here, 1.0111001 1. in base 2, is a coefficient. It is a coefficient because I multiply that by a power of 2, and 2 is the base of this entire thing. So it is a coefficient. The question is, is it also a mantissa? It is a mantissa because is it greater than or equal to 1? Yep, one point whatever in base two is definitely greater than or equal to one. The next question is, is it less than the base itself? Is this less than two? The question, how is two represented in base two? One zero. This is only one point something, so it's, it's less than one zero in base two, and therefore it is less than two. So it is a mantissa in base two, yep. The whole thing. So 1.0111001 1. 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1 is the mantissa. <clears throat> All right. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. So now the next question is, um, so how does this have anything to do with floating point number representation? So this is where you're having a picture is really helpful. But since I am recording, okay, so you can basically just go like, okay, you know, we're going to go back to, you know, 10 minutes past 6, okay, to this portion here. Because the focusing on the concept is more important. So I'm just going to tell you that this portion here, okay, these digits will go to the pink portion. Then you go like, tech, don't you also mean that one point is a part of the pink portion? The answer is no. Only the fractional part of the mantissa is actually represented in a double. So that means this particular bit here, let me move the mouse pointer. <clears throat> so that means you know, if I were to use a double representation, a double precision floating point number representation, this would be the zero, this would be one, 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 zero, uh, I, can't, I lost count already, 0, 0, 1, and then the rest would all be zeros. That's, that's where the fractional part of the mantissa would go. This one here, okay, bit 63, is known as the sine bit. In other words, if the entire value is positive, that sine bit is going to be a zero. If the entire um, value is negative, that sine bit would be a if it's negative, it's a one. If it's non-negative, it is a zero. Yep. Oh, is it the same thing as like the, the bar or the carry bit? 
not quite. This one is quite explicitly just saying whether the value is negative or not. So it has no comparison whatsoever. So when we look at the value that we are trying to represent, is it negative? No. It's not, right? You know, if it were negative, we would have seen a negative symbol here. So it is not negative, which means you know, bit 63 is going to be a zero. So there's only one part, one part that has not been represented yet. Which part is it? We got the sign, we got the mantissa. So which part is not represented yet? The exponent. The base is already implicit too, okay? So we don't have to represent two, but we do have to represent the exponent. So the exponent in the number is this four over here, okay? So this is the four and we need to fit it somewhere. But we already talked about the pink portion is the fractional part of the mantissa. We have used it up already. The blue portion, bit 63, is the sign bit. We used it already. So what is the only portion that we have not used yet? The green portion. So that means the green portion is responsible to represent the exponent of two, which means we have to somehow use the green portion to represent four in this case. Is that okay? Just in terms of concept, okay? How is four represented in the pink portion? I haven't talked about it yet, but we know that we're gonna use the green portion to represent the power of four or the exponent of, four, the exponent of two here. Is that okay? All right, so this is where things get a little weird, okay? Because you, sometimes you want to represent really, really uh, values that are really close to zero. I'm not talking about negative. I'm talking about values that are really close to zero, such as uh, what is one electron volt? What, what is the charge of one single electron? <laughs> it's not, it is negative, but what is the quantity? What, what is the, the value? What is, how close is, is it to zero? What is one EV? Yes. Yes, it's a very small value, very close to zero. So that means in that case, this exponent of two is going to be negative. Does that make sense? Because you cannot change the mantissa. The mantissa has to be greater than or equal to one and less than two. You cannot change that. But what you can change is the exponent of two. And if you, if you instead of using four, you can make, a, make it a very negative value, then you are going to have a very small multiplier to the mantissa. Does that make sense? So that means the green portion cannot just be used to represent um, non-negative values. We have to have the ability to represent negative values as well. So as a student in this class, as a computer science person, you would think, oh, we get this, signed representation, easy peasy. No, that's not the case. <laughs> that is because this is not a it's not a computer science person who make who, who invented this convention. Um, this is called the IEEE double precision floating point number format. What does IEEE stand for? That's electrical. That's engineer. Okay, so let's ask your chat and GPT. <laughs> what does IEEE represent? Okay. All right, so it's called the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. I don't see computer science or mathematician in here. So as electrical engineers, they chose a really obscure way to represent numbers that can be negative. Okay, so let me go back to uh, the slide that we were on. Okay, not this one. There we go. Okay, so the way they do it is they introduce a bias. <clears throat> this is called a bias. E is basically the unsigned value of the green portion. The green portion has 11 bits. So the way you do this is you look at those 11 bits as an unsigned integer, which means it cannot be negative. And then what do you do? You subtract 1,023 from it. So that means 
if you have all zeros in the green portion, then the exponent of two would be negative 1,023. If you max out the green portion, meaning turning everything into ones, then the green portion would be one, 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 11 ones, basically. That would be the value of 2,047. And then you subtract 1,023 from it, so that means the highest value you can represent as the exponent of two is 1,024, okay? Now, this is a very awkward way, okay, to give us the ability to represent negative exponents of two, but it is the way it is, okay? We cannot change that. We cannot change the standard. Is that okay? So that means, okay, so let's relate it back to the example that we have. For this specific example, we want the green portion to represent a value of four after taking the bias into consideration. So the question is, um, what would be the unsigned value that I actually need the green portion to represent? The bias is 1,023, so we need to represent 1,027, very good. All right, so I think we got this whole thing figured out at this point, so I am just gonna go back to my notepad here, keeping the picture in mind. So we know bit 63 is going to be a zero because the quantity is non-negative. Yes, go ahead. It is nowhere to be represented, which asks the next question, which is how do we represent zero, right? Zero turns out to be a special case. When everything is zero, we just say, yep, it is zero, even though it's not. Okay, so I'll further explain that tricky statement, okay? But right now, we'll, we'll, we'll work with this example, and then we'll work out the, the other statement a little bit later. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Yep, yep. It's close enough. This is the smallest value we can represent. We'll just call that zero. <laughs> All right, so, but looking at the bit pattern, okay? So we need 11 bits to represent 1,027, right? So that would be a one over here. Um, so that one is 1,024, 512, 256, 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, and then we need a, uh, we need no 4, 1, 2, and 1, 1. Okay, so that bit pattern would be representing 1,027 because we have a, we have a bias of 1,023. Okay, I just did the base conversion in my head. Did you guys follow the math though? Okay. All right. Yep. Because you know, 1,027 has 1,000 has 1, 1,024. No 512. No 256. Blah blah blah. Until we get to the two, we have one two left over, and then one one after that. So that's how I did the base conversion in my head. All right. So then what else? Okay. The pink portion. So now we have the pink portion. The pink portion, as I said, is only responsible for the fractional part of the mantizza. This is the mantizza, but it is the pink portion is only representing the fractional part. So that's basically what we need. I'm just going to copy and paste here, and a bunch of zeros after that. Okay. So I claim that if you filled up all this thing here with 64 binary digits or bits. It is how we represent, um, what was the original thing, 23.125. So I claim that this is the exact representation in IEEE double precision floating point format. Okay, so how many zeros do we have you know, here? Okay, you know, let's, let's try to figure out how many zeros are within this portion. We have to fill up, you know, um, basically the pink portion has how many bits? It has 52, 52 bits. Out of the 52, 
um, these seven have to be very specific. So that means whatever is left, there are 45 zeros in the highlighted portion in order to make up 52 zeros and ones. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, you look at this thing and go like, oh, this is a monster number to write out. Okay, because you'll, yeah, it is, because you have to write 64 zeros and ones. Okay, I cannot, I can, I'll probably make a mistake somewhere if I have to repeat this several times. Okay, so the way to do this is to turn it into what we call hexadecimal format first. So what is hexadecimal numbers? Okay, I heard a few answers. It is base, base 10 plus 6, which is base 16. <laughs> because uh, hexa is six, but we also have deci after that. So hexa deci means you know six plus ten, which is base sixteen. So you go like, why would we use your base sixteen? I thought your know, seven is odd enough. Well, seven really is an odd number, but sixteen is like, why would we use your know, base sixteen? I mean, it's more than ten. Well, as it turns out, base sixteen is a power of two. Okay, or I should say 16 is the power of 2. So the conversion from base 2 to base 16 is super easy. You just need to look up a table. There's no division involved. There's no mod involved. There's no addition, no subtraction, no comparison. Just a table lookup. Okay, so I'm going to give you the table. So to do the base conversion between base, 10, uh, base 2 and base 16, 0, 0, 0, 0 is known as zero in base 16. Wow, that's uh, surprising, right? <clears throat> zero, 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 one is known as one in base 16. Another wow, that's surprising. Zero, zero, one, zero is known as two in base 16. Mm. Zero, zero, one, one is known as three. Oops, I said three. Zero, one, zero, zero is known as four. Zero, one, zero, one is known as five. 0110 is known as 6. 0111 is known as 7. 1000 is known as 8. 1001 is known as 9. You go like, oh, attack. We, we know this stuff already from the wheel. Remember that wheel that I chopped up into 16 portions? These are the same things on that wheel, except from here on is a little bit strange. Because in order to represent what we know in base 10 as 10, we have to use a single digit to represent it. In base 10, there's no single digit to represent the quantity of 10. So what do we do? Eh, we just borrow from the alphabet. So we call this A. And then we call this B. And this is C. And this is D. This is E. And finally, we have F. So that's how we do conversion between base 2 and base 16. It's really just looking up a table like this. Yep. Yeah. So if you were to convert it to like a base, the base option, can you still have that's more than 9? Okay, you have to use base 16 to represent. Uh huh. Like if you were using a different base, uh -huh. and somehow you could still pass 36. You run out of letters you want. Oh, okay, I got the perfect answer for your question. <clears throat> so I'm going to get to chat and GPT again. Where's my chat and GPT window? Uh, I lost it somewhere. Okay, it's called base 64. <laughs> So base 64 is a real thing, and um, so you know, let's say simply enter your data and press the decode button. Okay, that's not going to be helpful. So you go, if you go to Wikipedia, it talks about base 64. So base 64 is something that's really useful. You have been using it at least hundreds of times today. Every time you pull up your phone and you look at a picture, that binary data is transmitted in base 64. And that is because HTTP as a protocol 
it's an ASCII-only protocol. It cannot be used to transmit binary data, which your pictures are. So how do we encode you know, pictures, which are binary data? We use Base64. So the way it works is it uses all the lowercase, uppercase, the, all the digits, and some punctuations. So you can see you know, um, the quantity value of zero is um, uppercase A, and then you get up to uh, 63 is represented by the slash. So it is used, it's used in real life, okay? Because you know, when you have a protocol, a networking protocol that is ASCII only, which means it can only you know, enter things up to ASCII code 127, and you cannot use control, uh, the control characters, uh, like you know, the enter key is control, is 13, ASCII code 13, and so on. So that doesn't leave you a lot of choices. So the best you can do is to transmit six binary digits per byte that you're transmitting. So it's not really that efficient because the efficiency is only, what, 75%. You're still wasting two bits out of eight because it is an ASCII protocol. But this is the best we can do. And it is known as base 64. So I hope this answers your question because we don't, we, we don't have to use the digits to mean what the digits really originally mean. All that is, is just you know, a binary bit pattern that we are transmitting when we just need to know in base 64 in this case, what does that, di what does that character represent? That's all we need. So in this case, if you see the lowercase t character, it is representing the binary bit pattern of 101101, and that's all you need to know. All right, so I hope that answers your question. You know, there are bases you know, outside of your know, base 16 and base 64 is commonly used, you know, just because we use the internet and HTTP hypertext transport protocol is an ASCII uh, protocol. So the only way we can transmit binary data is to do something like this. All right, so I'm glad you asked the question. Excellent. There we go, back to here. Okay, so back to the conversion process. So that means you're know, using this table, I will do the conversion. So when you do the conversion, the best way you want to do, the first thing you want to do is to take out the spaces and then you chop things up into groups of four. So four, 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 and a bunch of zeros. So that's a four, that's a zero, that's a three, that's a seven, that's a two, and how many zeros do I need in base 16 in this case? Okay, first of all, how many base 16 digits do I need to represent 64 bits? Each base 16 digit represents four bits. I have 64 bits to represent. So the question is how many hexadecimal digits do I need? You guys can do division, right? 64 divided by 16, excuse me, divided by four is 16, okay. So out of the 16 digits, I got the first, the most significant five already figured out. So that means I have, what, 11 zeros left, okay? I can type 11 zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Okay, I think that's right. So this is how we represent you know, the value that we originally wanted to represent in C and C++, when you use 0x as a prefix, it means the rest of the number is in base 16 or hexadecimal. So in this case, we have 4, 0, 3, 7, 2, and then 11 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. There we go. Sometimes I feel like the count in Sesame Street. Yes. You mean the, the zero x? Yeah. So the zero x prefix means whatever is following the x is a hexadecimal number. Oh. Not in base 10, not in base eight, but in base 16. But in this case, you know, it just so happens that we do not have any of the A, B, C, D, E, F in it, but it really is a you know, base 16 number. All right. So the next question is, you guys go through this entire process and you're frowning and go like, how do we know 
the tech, you're correct about this, right? How do we prove this? At least for this particular example, can you show us how um, this particular bit pattern is really representing what we know as 23.125? So that's a, that's a good question, okay? How many people have learned how to use a union in C++ or regular C, in CISP 360? Was the concept of union, which is sort of related but opposite to struct, you, uh, introduced in CISP 360? Nope. Okay. We don't need that. I can actually do this without you know, that. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, write a sample program to illustrate, you know, to prove that this conversion process does work. Ah, nope, I just magnified the wrong screen. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna write a complicated program here. Okay, uh, we'll call it test.c, and we'll pound include stdint.h, standard integer.h, that's what it stands for, which then allows me to specify the width of the integer types. In this case, I'm gonna use un64 underscore t, which means I am now using this as a 64-bit unsigned integer. Because, you know, yeah, go ahead. Because without the zero x, then, it be, then by default, it is a decimal number. Okay. So I have local variable x here, x equals to zero, return zero. That's the entire program. Yes, I said it was a complicated program. I was just kidding. And this program has nothing to do with double, float, or anything like that. Well, it serves only one purpose. I'm, doing, I'm compiling the program right now, and I'm gonna use GDB. GDB is a great tool, but in this case, I'm not even really debugging the program. I'm putting a breakpoint on line eight, run the program. Now it is, it has taken the, you know, it's, it has pulsed at line eight. And that's all I need, okay? All I need is a 64-bit unsigned integer. So now I can use another command in GDB to say set var um, x equals to, you know, whatever that bit pattern is, zero x four zero three seven two, and then 11 zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. There we go. Ding, all right. So go like, hmm. So I guess you know, if you print X magically, it's gonna come out as 23.125. Nope, that is not the case. <laughs> okay, oh, but tech, you know, that's because you did not specify your know, base 16. Let's print it as a hexadecimal number. Oh, we just got whatever we entered earlier. It's like, how does this relate it to, you know, the double representation? So I'm gonna work with variable x here, and you guys will tell me, you know, what the expression means, okay? Oh, some of you probably have heard of uh, typecasting, right? So you're gonna guess, oh, maybe this will do the trick. Unfortunately, it does not do the trick, because by the time the typecast operator is used, X, the value of X is already interpreted as a 64, 64 bit unsigned integer, which turns out to be this gigantic value over here. So all this is going to do is to turn it into a scientific notation, but we're not changing the value, okay? So it doesn't serve the purpose that we thought it would. So what I need to do is to do it step by step. So can someone tell me what is the syntax of this particular expression? Exactly, this is the address of X, which has a type of, the address of a 64-bit unsigned integer. Very good, okay? So I can just print it and go like, okay, you're absolutely right, okay? So this turns out to be the address, which is somewhere in memory, and then the type is a pointer or the address of an unsigned 64-bit integer, okay? Very good. So now I'm gonna go like, <clears throat> What about this? What is this expression now? What am I type casting? Am I type, yeah, go ahead. The data. I'm not yet dereferencing. So 
I'm casting the address. Okay, so right now, so I know, I think you know the answer already of where I'm going, but at this part, at the, in this particular step, all I did was to take the address of a 64-bit unsigned integer and typecast the address itself to be the address of a double. So we still have just an address, but the type of the address has changed. So when I type the enter key here, you can see, you can see that the address has not changed. What has changed is the type of the thing at that address. Are we doing okay so far? Yes? Hmm? Okay, so the original expression empress and x is the address of x, but since x itself is a unsigned 64-bit integer, so the address of x is naturally the address of a 64-bit unsigned integer, which was what we saw here at $4. What I did in the previous step is to typecast the address of x and say, okay, forget about this being the address of an unsigned 64-bit integer. I'm telling you, this is the address of a double, okay? In other words, I'm telling the compiler or debugger and say, I know what I'm doing, just do it, okay? And that's one of the best and worst part of C and C++ is in almost every single case, you can always tell the compiler to go like, I know you're gonna complain about this, but I know what I'm doing, so I will just let you tell you to do this. It looks stupid, but do it anyway, because I know better. That's C and C++ for you. Okay, so now that the debugger thinks the location seven FFFF, you know, blah, 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 six, uh, F68, is the address of a double, what do you think it's going to do when I say, oh, tell me what is over there? It is the same bit pattern, but it will interpret it not as a 64-bit unsigned integer. It will look at the exact 64 bits, but this time it will go to, guess what? It's gonna go to this picture and go like, okay, this is how I'm going to interpret the same exact 64 bits. I'm going to take the most significant bit and interpret it as the sign of the entire value. I'll take the next 11 bits as the biased exponent in base two, and I'm gonna take the rest of this, the next 52 bits, as the fractional part of a base two mantissa. And what I'm gonna do is to reconstitute the entire mantissa figure out the non-biased version of the exponent, multiply the mantissa with two to the power of the unbiased or debiased you know, exponent, and then take into consideration of the sign. That's what it's gonna do. So in, when I get back to the, the, the debugger and press the enter key, aha, we get our 23.125 back. So this is, Interesting in many ways because it is not just that this is telling you how a double is representing its value, but this is also a good way to kind of remind you of things that you should have learned in CISP 360. Now, I'm pretty sure in CISP 360, they have never combined the use of address of, typecast, and dereference in this particular way. Okay, I know that. But just because it was not introduced in 360 does not mean that it cannot be done. So you have to keep that in mind is, okay, I know I can do all of these things, but what does it mean? Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Okay, so I can... I can illustrate you know, what I mean by that. Um, actually, it is not easy to illustrate. Um, so let's say you want to store the value of three, okay? Um, let me get out of this program and go back to the program here. So this time we have um, a double uh, y 
and we'll make both of them to try to represent the value of three. Okay. Uh, GCC, GDB. Put a breakpoint on line 10, run the program to line 10. Okay. Now, if you do something just like this, then you go like, uh, tag, they're both representing three. This is correct. I told the program that X should represent the value of three and Y should also represent the value of three. But the way they are represented is different. So what we need to do now is to say, uh, give me the underlying your know, representation. Give me you know, exactly what bit pattern is behind it. Okay. So one way to do that is to say you know, print slash b, which is binary, uh, whatever is at um, the address of x. So we'll say you know, tell me what is um, this will do it. Size letter little. Okay, I cannot remember how to print in base two. Let's let's figure it out. Help. All right, so print option slash format. Okay, so we're looking at the format part. CX command, great. Um, binary is T, okay, who would have guessed? So tell me what is at X. It is one, one in base two. Okay, that's not really surprising. So now tell me what is at Y. But I have to cast it first. So this time I have to cast it in the opposite way. Okay. Uh, whew, it looks like that. But does it make sense? We actually understand enough to look at this and go like, yeah, I think we mix, it makes sense. Okay, let's let's break this up. This is, okay, first of all, we have to figure out how many zeros there are here. How many zeros do you think there are? <laughs> 63 zeros, I mean, not, not zeros, how many digits? That's what I was trying to ask. There are 63 digits. There's a leading one that is missing, okay? So the other way to do this, okay, that this is why binary is really kind of not the best way to look at things, but in hexadecimal, it's a whole lot easier. Because this four is a zero, one, zero, zero. So that means the sign bit is a zero, which means the value that we are representing is not negative. Does that work out for you? Okay. Um, and then we have zero, one, zero, zero. So the one, zero, zero is a part of the biased exponent. And so are the next two digits over here. So that means the, the biased exponent is really just 1,024. Okay? But that's biased. What is the biased amount again? How do I adjust the biased you know, exponent to get back to the original exponent that I need? Subtract 1,023. Okay? What is 1,024 minus 1,023? One. So that means the power of base two that I need, the exponent of two that I need to adjust it, is just one. We need to multiply whatever is rest, the rest by two. Okay. This one here, okay, so, oh, okay, take it back. This eight here is the most significant digit of the fractional part of the mantissa. Okay, so that means point 0.1 and then followed by a bunch of zeros as the fractional part of the mantissa. But there's an implicit one point, okay, that is not represented here. So that means the entire mantissa in base two is 1.1, 1 .1, and then a bunch of zeros after that. Does that make sense? What does 1.1 1 .1 in base two represent in base 10? 1.5, very good, because it's one times two to the power of zero plus one points two to the power of negative one, and the sum is 1.5. So 1.5 is the mantissa, the value of the mantissa, and we have to multiply that by two to the power of one. What, what do they add up to? Exactly, so we got three back. Is that okay? So this means you, know, you can, from the perspective of a programmer, C, C++, a programmer, we can have the two assignment statements to do things, you know, So we can have something that looks like this and totally unaware 
of how the threes are represented in the back end. But when you look into debugger after this class, okay, then you start to understand, oh, so the first three is a whole bunch of zeros with two ones all the way to your right-hand side because you know, we have one, one plus one, two. But the other three on line nine is represented entirely differently because it's a double. Yeah. And I'm assuming that the double takes up like six numbers. No, it's six. The integer, uh, the u in 64 underscore t is like a 64 bit number. So it takes up the same 64 bits. It's just how you interpret the bits that is different. I'm going to take roll. Yes, I know, you know it's at the end of the class, but I still want to do it. Yes, go ahead. It's 1.5 in base 10 times 2 to the power of 1. So let's take roll first. Here. We still got only about two minutes to do it. Uh, the uh, access code is double, which is not really surprising. Because 1.1 in base 2 as a mantisa is representing 1.5 in base 10. And then the biased exponent is 1,024, which means once I get rid of the bias amount, it is just one. So that is two to the power of one, which is just two. So today's lab is gonna be interesting because it is a reminder of your math, that the math that you kind of need to know in order to do base conversion. So later on, I'll give you a programming project to convert from base 10 scientific notation to base two scientific notation. So that's why we are going through uh, floating point one as the lab today. Um, let me unhide it first. You need to know the access code to get to this one. So let me give you the access code. So the access code is IEEE or the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineer. <laughs> That's a mouthful. All righty. I'll see you guys over at the lab.